Hello everyone. So our today's topic of discussion is uterine fibroids, also called as leiomyoma. We are basically discussing the causes of abnormal uterine bleeding, that is the palm coin classification, where palm refers to the structural causes and coin refers to the non-structural causes. And we have already discussed about P and A in the palm coin classification, that was polyps and adenomyosis. If you have not watched the previous videos, I request you to watch them in series sequence for a better understanding. So let us proceed with today's topic. Now, as we are already done with P and A, that is polyps and adenomyosis, next comes L in the palm coin classification and the L stands for leomyoma, which is the synonym for uterine fibroids. So uterine fibroids must be a more common term which we are all aware of. So uterine fibroids are nothing but the benign smooth muscle tumor originating from the uterine myometrium, that is the muscle of the uterus. But fibroids are not always very scary as they are benign growth, which means they are not cancerous and have a very, very, very low potential to turn into a cancer. It is in fact the most common pelvic tumor found in a woman of reproductive age group. Uterine fibroids are most commonly found in the women of reproductive age group and the reason behind it is that the fibroids are estrogen dependent for their growth. Hence, we can see the fibroids shrinking in the women who have attained menopause. Even though the exact etiology of fibroids is not clear, the risk factors include older women who are nulliparous, that means who have never been pregnant, and the women with a history of early onset of menarche, that is who have attained menarche at a very early age, are seen to be at an increased risk of uterine fibroids. Other risk factors include obesity, a diet rich in red meat and simultaneously a diet which is poor in fibers and alcohol consumption. Now let us go through the types of fibroids but before that we need to know well the wall the layers of the wall of the uterus about which I have discussed in depth in my previous video of adenomyosis. But let us make a quick revision about the layers of the wall of the uterus. The outermost serous layer is the perimetrium. So this outermost layer is the perimetrium. Next we have is the myometrium, which is the muscular layer of the wall of the uterus. And the innermost layer inside here is the endometrium. Now let us discuss about the types of fibroids. All right. First we have is the intramural fibroid. So we have an intramural fibroid in, inside, so embedded well inside the muscle of the uterus. So intramural fibroids are embedded into the uterine myometrium and are the most common type. Now these fibroids grow and project inside or outside the uterine cavity depending upon their growth. So here you can see a intramural fibroid which is growing inside so this one okay which is growing inside the uterine cavity and here you can see a fibroid intramural fibroid which is growing outside the uterine cavity so depending upon which direction they grow they grow either inside the uterine cavity or outside the uterine cavity and they these these fibroids have different names so yes we are going to discuss about that Next we have is the submucosal fibroid. So this fibroid here, which is projecting inside the uterine cavity, this one is the submucosal fibroid because it is projecting inside the mucosal layer, the innermost layer of the uterus, hence the name submucosal fibroids. Now submucosal fibroids grow in the inner lining of the uterus and they are the most troublesome. The most notorious type of fibroids as they are mostly responsible for causing heavy menstrual bleeding and other related symptoms. Next type is the subserosal fibroids. The fibroid, this is this one. This one is a subserosal fibroid which, is, which grows outside to the outermost layer of the uterus. 
subserosal fibroids grow under the lining of the outer surface of the uterus they become quite large and grow into your pelvis this is a small one that i've shown they can be as large as this okay they can be really really big all right they can even be pedunculated we can have a pedicle here and they are suspended okay in in the pelvis all right so with only with the help of a pedicle so this is a subserosal fibroid next we have is the pedunculated fibroid they are attached to the uterus with a stalk or stem and they are often described as mushroom like because they have a stalk and then a wider top so here this is the pedunculated fibroid you can see this is having a stem a pedicle attached to the wall of the uterus and then the actual fibroid is suspended inside the cavity it can be either inside the cavity or it can be either outside the uterine cavity so the pedunculated fibroid can be even outside so it is suspended with the help of a pedicle and the polyp is suspended into the uh, pelvic cavity or the uterine cavity all right here we can see the fibroids have their origin or begin in the smooth muscle of the uterus and most of the time fibroids arise from the body now this is the body of the uterus okay from the body of the uterus but very rarely we can see fibroids arising from the cervix as well which is very rare now this we can see here this this fibroid here is a fibroid arising from the cervix so cervical fibroids are also rarely seen now let us see the signs and symptoms of uterine fibroids so uterine fibroids are most often asymptomatic and are mostly found incidentally now for example a woman you know goes to get a sonography done of her abdomen pelvis for some other uh, symptoms or for some other reason and the reports show a small fibroid inside the uterus which is not causing her any kind of symptom this is very common okay so hence we can say that most of the time uterine fibroids are asymptomatic and are usually found incidentally but when they are symptomatic the symptoms include heavy or prolonged menstrual bleeding uh, the signs and symptoms of uterine fibroids are mostly caused by the virtue of its size and location the most common cause of heavy and abnormal menstrual bleeding is submucous fibroids as it increases the surface area of the endometrium to bleed so we have seen what a submucous fibroid is the fibroid which protrudes inside the uterine cavity and we have also seen that it is the most notorious one and the one which causes heavy menstrual bleeding as it increases the surface area of the endometrium to bleed we have also here in this picture we can also see a pedunculated fibroid which is also called as a fibroid polyp now fibroid polyps as we have seen can lead to intermenstrual bleeding okay another symptom could be intermenstrual bleeding and the reason for this we have discussed in our previous video of polyps that is the outer layer of the polyp this outer layer of the polyp may undergo necrosis or there could be twisting or torsion of the pedicle of the polyp and necrosis of the fibroid all of this could contribute to heavy menstrual bleeding okay next symptom is lower abdominal pain or dysmenorrhea now when it comes to dysmenorrhea fibroids usually do not cause severe dysmenorrhea the major cause of pain could be you know the major cause leading to dysmenorrhea could be the torsion of the pedicle of the pedunculated fibroid okay or the necrosis of the fibroid as we have already discussed another symptom which is not very common but the women usually complain of is lower back pain okay that is uh, that co again comes into a category of pressure symptom okay about which we will be discussing in our next slide so yes next we have is uh, the list of 
pressure symptoms of uterine fibroids we know that the urinary and gastrointestinal tract lies in close proximity to the uterus so if there is a large fibroid protruding out uh, the serosa or if there is uh, if there are multiple large fibroids then they can exert pressure on the urinary and gastrointestinal tract okay so if there is a large fibroid that is pressing upon the urinary bladder then the woman may experience increased frequency of urination due to constant pressure and irritation of the bladder on the other hand if there is a large fibroid that is pressing upon the urethra there may be obstruction of the urethra leading to urine retention okay that is she might not be able to pass urine similarly if the fibroid is exerting pressure on the terminal parts of the gastrointestinal tract which includes the rectum okay there might be issues with constipation so if there is a large subserosal fibroid that is suspended upwards okay into the pelvic cavity the woman may also experience abdominal fullness okay as if there is something large something uh, a big uh, you know they may say the abdomen feels heavy or there is a constant fullness of the abdomen now infertility due to fibroids this again will be highly dependent on the size and location of the fibroids so the submucous fibroids submucous fibroids that protrude inside the uterine cavity again are the primary culprits that contribute to infertility if there is a fibroid in the internal os blocking the ascent of sperm so here at the internal os if there is a big fibroid which is blocking the ascent of the sperms or we have a huge fibroid in the uterine cavity particularly near the opening of the fallopian tubes here near the ostia we have a big fibroid okay that is again blocking the ascent of sperm uh they could definitely lead to infertility now a small fibroid here which is uh, embedded inside the uh, musculature inside the muscle of the uterus which is the intramural fibroid a small subserosal fibroid here okay could they lead to infertility it is still debatable it is still controversial okay but the submucous fibroids they definitely could be one major reason for infertility now let us see the investigations done to rule out uterine fibroids the primary investigation ordered will be a complete blood count to rule out anemia especially if the woman complains of heavy menstrual bleeding then the most common investigation that your doctor will order is the ultrasonography which will give an idea about the size location and the number of fibroids you may also be asked to do a transvaginal sonography now for better understanding especially in the cases of submucous fibroids we could proceed doing a saline infusion sonography which will put light on the intracavitary fibroids this helps us to diagnose submucous fibroids or fibroid polyps better hysteroscopy is another investigation that will help us to better identify intracavitary fibroids now in women above 40 years of age endometrial biopsy will be an important investigation to be done to rule out endometrial hyperplasia or cancer now the line of treatment will be decided by your doctor and it will be purely case specific and depending upon the severity of the symptoms so if the woman is asymptomatic there is obviously no need to initiate any kind of treatment in symptomatic cases the treatment will depend upon the severity of the symptoms and the fertility status of the woman your doctor may suggest conservative management like iron supplements or give you symptomatic medications like medications to reduce the pain or abdominal discomfort and also the amount of bleeding during periods the surgical management includes myomectomy or total hysterectomy which could be considered if the symptoms fail to improve with conservative management 
or if the symptoms are of a greater severity causing further complications. So stay tuned everyone as we will be continuing with the discussion of abnormal uterine bleeding in our upcoming videos. Do consider to like, share and subscribe to the channel if this information was useful to you and follow me on Instagram for more such helpful health related topics. Thank you.